It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Both France and Germany are concerned about journalists of French and German citizenship arrested in Turkey after the referendum that expanded and consolidated power for the president's office in Turkey, which took place in April. Tensions between Europe and Turkey have increased. This is due to disagreements they had over the kind of campaigning that President Erdogan of Turkey may or may not do to court the Turkish communities in other countries, mainly Europe. As the tensions escalate, politicians in Germany with Turkish roots report that they live in constant fear of attack by pro Erdogan activists who consider them to be traitors. Giran Oskan is a sociology graduate from the University of Warwick in England and an editor at the KurdishQuestion.com. He joins us today. Thank you so much, Giran. Hi, thank you for having me. So, uh, Giran, President Erdogan of Turkey has been consolidating his power after the coup attempt of July 2016. The latest move happened this week, an overhaul of his own party structure uh, leading up to the election schedule for 2019. Was it not enough that er Erdogan now had this referendum, affirmed himself and consolidated his powers in the presidency? Does he fear losing this upcoming election? Well, um, I mean, the referendum uh, was to change the constitution. So uh, after that was uh, voted in uh, narrowly, uh, we must add, um, that uh, set the election, the actual first presidential election for which Erdogan uh, pushed for is in 2019. So yes, the actual narrow margin of the referendum has got Erdogan worried uh, about whether he can actually pull off a pull off an election victory in 2019 because we must remember that in the referendum it was just two choices that was available to the people whether they wanted this constitutional change or not and uh, Erdogan was able to rally around uh, Turkish nationalists right-wing nationalists ultra nationalists uh, from the MHP which is the nationalist movement party in Turkey uh, and they have about 9 to 10%, they pull in about 9 to 10% in general elections. So uh, if we take that out of the equation, then Erdogan himself uh, is, you know, if we look at polls as well, can muster about 40, 42% of the general vote. So on its own, his uh, party support will not be enough to uh, get, you know, get in the presidency, especially with the opposition parties like the CHP and the HDP, um, hoping to maybe come up with a candidate that they can both support in the presidential election. So uh, the referendum, uh, the narrow margin uh, which uh, Erdogan won with, has actually now got him worried that uh, the presidential system that he wanted, he might not be able to occupy the presidency. He might not be able to win the seat that uh, he had constitutionally changed through the referendum itself. Do you think that um, that uh, Europe can stand the pressure that Erdogan is placing on them? Well, uh, in all honesty, Erdogan's been able to use uh, certain realities on the ground to his advantage. I mean, he's basically holding Europe to ransom. He's uh, actually blatantly blackmailing Europe and he's been doing this for the past few years uh, with the Syrian conflict uh, with the influx of hundreds of thousands of if millions of refugees into Turkey um, he actually openly threatened Europe uh, just a year and a half ago in a in a public meeting where he said what would happen if I allowed all of these refugees to cross you know to just break through my borders and cross into Europe and uh, I mean, this has, uh, by all accounts, scared Europe a lot. Uh, and although when we listen to European leaders such as uh, Germany's Angela Merkel, uh, none of them are happy with the way uh, Erdogan is conducting himself or administering uh, the country. Uh, they're, they're full of criticisms, whether it's press freedoms, whether it's, uh, you know, just uh, all the pressure he's putting on uh, the opposition, the political opposition within the country, 
Uh, no one's happy with the way he's running the country, but uh, in the same breath, you can see that these leaders aren't actually doing much to change what's going on in Turkey. I mean, people are uh, expressing their discontent to Erdogan, especially to Erdogan, but no one's actually following these up with any uh, actions that might change the way Erdogan is running the country. And it seems uh, that Erdogan's threats have done the trick, um, especially in Germany, where the influx of hundreds of thousands of refugees had uh, a lot of, you know, the opposition put a lot of pressure on Angela Merkel. She was criticized severely, even by the left in Germany. I mean, she's uh, not a leftist herself, but uh, we're talking about a country where even the Social Democrats were criticizing Merkel for allowing so many people into the country. It was, she was almost championed by, you know, she was the, the leader of the Christian Democrats that was, you know, humanitarian and allowed so many refugees coming in, but she was criticized for it. And it seems that she's unable to uh, handle that criticism now, especially with the German elections coming up so close. Um, so from uh, what we can see is that Erdogan's threats have really worked in preserving uh, his style of government, his uh, authoritarian style that he's been practicing in the country now for the best part of a decade uh, and although after last year's uh, attempted coup uh, Erdogan really raised the level of uh, suppression in Turkey against everyone I mean even people of his own party are very very weary of where Erdogan might uh, target his fury against uh, and so um, I mean what we can see right now is that Erdogan is doing a good job in preserving his style of government, preserving his personal and uh, sta personal status and also the status of his family. I mean, a lot of his family members are now in government uh, or they are reaping the benefits of him being in government with his sons uh, stashing millions of dollars in shoeboxes and whatnot. Uh, so what we can see is that Erdogan is really pulling this off uh, quite magically, actually, in some ways, because he does have certain things that he can use against uh, the Western countries that sometimes raise a voice against this style of government. And it seems to be doing the trick. Speaking of raising his voice against these government, the language that Erdogan has been using has been extremely harsh, uh, antagonizing, um, commenting that Turkey could conquer Europe in three days, uh, calling the Dutch government a Nazi government and warning Europeans that they wouldn't be able to walk safely in the streets of Europe if it wasn't for him, uh, because he had the power to unleash refugees on them, therefore creating this sort of uh, hyper um, anti-immigrant sentiment uh, in Europe. What response do such statements evoke in Turkey? Um, there has all already been a worsening of trade relations between Turkey and Germany for uh, for a long time now, but this must not be faring well in Turkey itself. Well, surprisingly, I mean, Erdogan has a uh, has consolidated uh, support amongst about we can say roughly forty percent of the population, and by and large. Uh, they support their charismatic leader the way they see Erdogan. Uh, they support him in whatever, whatever he does. I mean, whether he's ruining relationships with Russia or, or whether he's uh, you know, ruining, ruining the, uh, tarnishing the reputation of Turkey across uh, the whole Western world, uh, they don't seem to mind too much. Uh, and right now, from what we can see from uh, election results, is that he's always able to preserve uh, that 40 to 42 percent support amongst uh, Turkey's citizens. Now, uh, I mean, this shows a couple of things. One, that Erdogan really uh, is happy with just uh, polarizing the country, uh, which he's done very, very well. I mean, uh, you either love him or absolutely detest him in Turkey. Uh, and, uh, and I think that polarizing politics has served him well. That's why he doesn't mind continuing that uh, polarizing uh, rhetoric that he's always using. Uh, and the other thing is that he can then stand up against the leaders of any Western country, whether the economy of the country is going down the drain or not. Uh, he seems to be able to rally uh, support through either a religious rhetoric, as what you said earlier. I mean, 
this neo-Ottoman uh, rhetoric that he uh, develops uh, actually rings very well with uh, a certain part of the country, uh, because as you know, Turkey is a, a predominantly Muslim country, uh, although not many uh, would uh, like a, a, you know, distancing Turkey from the Western world. There is a certain segment of the society of, of the country, uh, a high majority in central Anatolia, cent the, you know, centrally in Turkey, that that uh, respond to uh, the rhetoric that Erdogan develops against the West, where uh, you know the West uh, want to rid the world of Islam, and Erdogan is the sole leader in the Middle East that is willing to stand up against the West, uh, all, almost the champion of the religion itself against uh, the colonizing West. Hmm. Um, and this is my last question. Uh, how is it that uh, Erdogan is able to um, re repress, suppress people living um, outside of uh, the country, uh, in the diaspora? Or how is it that he's able to repress people of German and French uh, descent in Turkey itself? How is he conducting these two sets of activities? Well, uh, I'll be very crude with how he's doing it outside of the country because uh, in 2013, three uh, women Kurdish politicians were assassinated in Paris, in the center of Paris, by Turkish intelligence services. I mean, uh, the person that was actually imprisoned by the French authorities, uh, the main suspect for these murders, uh, was associated with the Turkish intelligence services. And, he died, uh, for, you know, he had a brain tumor and he died in prison before the case could even be heard, uh, could even be tried. Um, so that's one tactic. Uh, the security, so, you know, the intelligence services of the country are operating in Europe. We've had some other cases come out in uh, Germany where even clerics, uh, religious clerics have been used to uh, gain uh, intelligence uh, from within their own communities and the Turkish state has been using these as well and they, these were actually announced by the German government. Uh, so uh, that's one way he's been doing it outside. He's been using Interpol, for example, uh, Angela Merkel, again, the, the German leader, uh, only a couple of days ago actually said that Turkey were, was abusing the Interpol system uh, to suppress opposition voices even outside of the country. And that's how uh, a German national was uh, arrested in Spain. Uh, a journalist was arrested in Spain through Interpol. Uh, and the Turkish authority, the Turkish government, uh, are using Interpol to their, you know, for their own means, for their own political uh, aims and ambitions. So that's one way he's doing it outside of the country. Uh, inside of the country, he's pretty comfortable, to be honest. Uh, inside of the country, he's taken charge of almost every single security institution uh, or, or even judicial institution in the country, uh, there is absolutely no one to stand in his way uh, while he uh, rids the whole country of any uh, opposition voice. Uh, and uh, those that want to report on it are also uh, closed down. Uh, as you know, there's over 160 journalists in prison in Turkey right now. Uh, for, for only, you know, they're only doing their jobs. There is no other allegation against these people other than reporting on what the government is doing in the country. Uh, and the sad fact is that there's absolutely uh, no way that anyone can resist against this in the country right now. Um, although there are politicians and activists who are trying to get their voices heard uh, inside the country, but Erdogan, especially after last year's coup attempt, has uh, used that coup attempt to tremendous effect to uh, shut up any voice that may criticize his government at any level, or himself at any level. Uh, and so, yeah, it's uh, inside the country, it's much easier for him, but he's also able to use a lot of means and tactics outside of the country as well, as we've seen in, uh, in only the last few weeks where he's uh, imprisoned journalists all over European countries. Uh, but the sad fact is that in Turkey, he's able to do this much easier. And with the threats that he's sending out, dishing out to Europe, uh, these are going largely unchallenged in the international community. 
All right, Kiran, I so much uh, appreciate the time you've given us today and look forward to further analysis with you uh, on Turkey and obviously beyond. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me on. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.